then I'm going to hijack this time slightly for uh, the continuing coverage of the briefing <laughs> shitstorm. Now, what I very much hope is that the people that are worried and complaining about the situation are sitting in the room right now. I have very little sympathy for people who complain and who do not show up. However, for the sake of clarification, I want to make a couple of things clear for the 17th time. Okay, first of all, I'm going to have office hours for an hour earlier today, 2.30 until 4.30, okay? So my normal hours are 1, 3.30 to 4.30. I might run out and get a coffee so I don't fall down. But if you have worries and you want to talk about on the side, come and see me in office hours. Uh, secondly, I, I didn't realize the dynamics of this assignment would be so uh, difficult, mostly because not only was it an unusual assignment called Write Something About Something, that maybe you weren't used to seeing, but also the grading method is also unusual. So there's a double kind of uncertainty, and uh, the good news is that all of you are experiencing it at the same time. So uh, I'm just I'm acknowledging that that's created some anxiety for people, for the people that are here, for the not here. It's just I'm just uh, I'm taking a big mental note about this. All right, so remember I was talking about the difference between risk and uncertainty, okay? The idea is that if, if every person in the class was grading every other person in this class on the assignment, we would get some kind of bell curve like we're used to. And your grade would probably be where you deserve it, right? That would be a risk-based grading system. But unfortunately, there's only three people that are grading your thing. So there's this uncertainty problem, and everybody's going, well, what if I get these three people and I get an F, and I don't deserve it, right? Now, I realize that dynamic and that fear is in your minds, collectively, or some of you, but that is just, unfortunately, the price that we have to pay, okay? It's not gonna be the end of the world. I doubt that you're gonna get three bad draws, three people that just don't understand you, but it's possible, okay? I think the best thing to do is wait until you see what comes back, right? Don't have a whole bunch of fear about what could come back, because I have that fear every day. But we'll wait until and see what's realized. Uh, secondly, I, and this is like part of the bigger picture, so hopefully, you know, the, the feelings that some people are feeling, the anxiety, is actually, I think, a constructive way of understanding in what's called in the business, F-U-D. Who's heard of that before? stand for, anybody? Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Now, it's like, oh my god, I'm having FUD about my grade, right? And, and the good news is that you are feeling this, those of you who are feeling this, some of you are like, I'm so bored of this, right? But those of you who are feeling it, I want you to take that thing and I want you to file it away when you think about um, the dynamics of politics, right? And the way that politicians use FUD all the time to convince people, for example, that we have to go invade Iraq, right? Because we have an imminent threat of a nuclear weapon coming from Iraq. That was what was going on back in 2001. And so we went off and invaded this country and whoops, that didn't happen, right? Now, I'm not going to say that George Bush was lying, but it was a very powerful dynamic that, was, that people were, that were being manipulated in the political sphere. And if you're feeling FUD about your grade, then now you understand a little bit about, more about politics, and that's what this class is also about. Um, the other thing is that great, I, I, I know you do not want to hear that grades don't matter. They don't. Learning matters, right? All of the people that are here know that learning matters because you're still here. The people that are not here, you guys, if you're even watching the tape, right, I don't know what to say. My sympathy, as I said, is very, very small. Um, I don't know what the, the distribution of grades right now is 73% as average. Is that normal for a UC Berkeley class? Or are you guys all above average? <laughs> right? Because there's a lot of grade fear going around. And I don't know what's going on, but remember that only 35 of your points have been assigned so far. Um, oh God, yeah, you know. Our grades all that matters, money all that matters. This is the whole point of economics. Remember economists, we don't study money. We study happiness, right? And what makes you happy may not be money. That's the whole intrinsic motivation thing, right? So 
I'm just trying to touch on a few things just in case you needed some philosophical background about why you shouldn't care about this whole firestorm of, oh my god, I might get a bad grade on an assignment, oh no. And then there was, a, there was a, a, an email that I got from someone saying, I didn't feel like I had the tools to answer this question very well. I didn't feel prepared, I, read the logic, I did read the logic of collective action, somebody actually was doing their, their work. But the thing that was important uh, that this person was saying, I, I felt a little bit out of my depth. And I gave you this assignment not just to push you in terms of being a professional and writing an encyclopedia entry. I gave it to you to push you to think about these issues, even if you've never thought about them before, even if you feel like it's out of your depth. Right? The whole point is that you're going to give it a shot. And then in the process of thinking about it and writing about it, you will learn about it. And that, of course, is the, is the lesson. That's what you're meant to do. So doing a perfect job is not the point. Right? Thinking about it and getting to it is a point. Last thing, logistically, I want you to bring two copies of every grade. Write this down, okay? Here's the protocol. There's going to be front copy, second copy. This is the original that you're grading, right? So that's the brief. This is your grade. And this is a copy of your grade, of your grade of that brief, okay? And that's because we, the graders, are going to grade your grade, tear that off, return that to you. The one that you will leave one there for the person whose brief it is. Does that make sense? Everybody understand that? Okay. I'm going to, unfortunately, I'm going to have to send an email because clearly half the class is in here. But you all have got the heads up, and I will send people out the corridor to go do their work, right? So bring in three copies, staple them together. Put the SID, what did I say the SID? Your SID is supposed to be where? Top right, right, right. Yours is top right. You. And theirs is top left, right? Is that right? Did I say that? Yeah. I'm trying to be consistent, but I'm uh, old. On the top, um, on the top left, grade E. Grade Grade E. Uh, top left is grade, grade D. You're the grade GER. I know, you say grade D. Okay, yeah, that's them, the grade D. E. Yeah? Okay. That's all I have to say. Are there any other questions for the moment? Can we leave this one sit for a little while? I really appreciate the dialogue we've had. I think all of your concerns are valid. And um, it's a learning situation, learning process. Anything else open? Yeah. Oh, I forgot a big point. How are we supposed to grade? I've said it a million, a million times, right? In the original assignment, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to write a briefing for a politician. You're supposed to address getting reelected more than anything. Now, some people said, I implied this, right? I wrote about stuff, and special interests are implied. If you are the grader and you're reading it, and you're like, and you're the politician, step in the politician's shoes, okay? <laughs> And you say, I'm reading this, I think I can get re-elected with this. That's what I want you to be thinking. Can I get re-elected with this? Okay? If they don't say the special interest is going to have a 0.25% share, it doesn't matter. Okay? And here's an important point. Thank God you asked that question. I missed the main point. There's an overlap between a briefing and addressing special interests, right? This is where you want to be. You want to be in the sweet spot. You write a briefing that does address special interests, okay? If you wrote a briefing and you don't do it, implicitly or explicitly, then you have done um, the wrong thing, right? If you just write about special interests and it's not a briefing, which nobody was doing, then it'll be bad. But if you write well, if you write a good briefing and you're addressing this implicitly or explicitly so that the person who is reading it, you the grader, can understand how to get reelected, then you've done fine. Okay? You don't have to have a whole section called special interests. I hope that is a clarification and not an obfuscation. Okay? I've been saying it fairly consistently, but there was some fear about people that said I didn't address it directly. But if you got into the dynamics of who would be affected or can you get reelected, then, then you did okay, you did fine. If you did a good briefing, you did fine. Okay? If you did a brief and, and if you did a briefing saying that you know, everybody in Berkeley should uh, buy a whale because whales are good, all right? It's not going to work, 
right? Because everybody in Berkeley is not going to support you for re-election. So if you went off in la-la land about your, your dream and you didn't address these kinds of distribution questions, then you made a mistake. Okay, I think that's it. It's not it. I just have a So if there's just a sentence at the end that says, and I think this will get you re-elected, but it really won't, then that doesn't count. You have, is it credible? Like, you sit there and read it and say, no, it won't. Right? And when you grade it, say, no, it won't. I don't believe you. Your analysis fails to take this into consideration. But thank God you said that, because I'll get reelected or whatever. Okay? Yeah, I also think there's like a huge space constraint. So a lot of people didn't want to go through this whole prompt because we already knew it. So right. I think you should just go in thinking that already. Right. Yeah, Politicians so are obviously trying to get reelected. So right. That's what the I mean, if you sit there and say, you know, I'm, my policy is to kiss as many babies as possible and the special interest baby lobby kissing whatever, I mean, that's fine, right? But you have to fit it in there. And it's, I, it's, it's, I don't even know how to address this thing. There's like 90 different people with all their own opinions about what's right, and I'm sitting there in the middle trying to reconcile, impossible, right? So, and I try to be a dictator, but then it's like, oh, you're being vague, and this, and so, I'm, just use your best judgment, you're adults, okay? Can we just leave it at that? Okay? Please go ahead and talk. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Guys. All right, so T. Serkin, I'm just going to talk. I couldn't follow it all, but uh, yeah, do, do your best. I mean, uh, you're going to have to do it more in the future, I think, you know, reviewing other people's work. Uh, better practice and um, practice your integrity. Uh, yeah, I'm um, from Holland. Um, I met through a friend of mine who knows David. Um, who met David at a party. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it happens. And um, when you, you want, to, is this okay? Can you guys see okay? So I, I do get that. Um, hey, they have my. Uh, the, the, um, this is not a water economics class, right? This is more like a general economics class. Is that correct, David? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you're going to see a lot of water engineering stuff the next hour, and uh, yeah, just try to enjoy engineering. And I'll try to focus on, on the economics of, uh, of the matter. First, I, I have to focus on the uh, IT of the matter, because this is my... Okay, there we go. That's my desktop and not my presentation. <laughs> so, we'll see how that will turn out. Um, did we, did we, 15 minutes ago, have a... Uh, no, we had a um, desktop up there. We did. We do have sound. Desktop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do have the sound. Yeah. We only played the song. Uh, uh, the is that a, the hit uh, all the, all the sound or something? It's the thing that changes your screen. Yeah, yeah, that's that's F N F ten for me. Oh, this that cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it working? that are both, uh, that are, that have to unite different faculties, so they're inter-facultary institutions. Uh, I'm originally a product designer, uh, I worked in the fields of floating houses, as a matter of fact. Then I went to the faculty of architecture, and now I'm at the faculty of civil engineering, so that's why I have now this job of initiating projects that unite these three faculties, and then there's a fourth faculty, which is policy analysis. Um, I'm gonna... Uh, no, I can't see the screen here. Um, we don't have a remote. Uh, no. OK, 
Okay, so I'll, you know, I'll sort of stand like this. <laughs> stand like this. Anyway, Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. Um, this is, of course, an image from Google. And when I faced this, I realized that a good thing about Google is that everybody who uses it feels like he's in the center of the, of the universe, right? Uh, this is Holland, uh, a small country. Um, let's zoom in. We have the United Kingdom here, we have Belgium there, we have Germany there. Um, and um, uh, these are uh, uh, same scales, so you see that uh, our lake is bigger than yours. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as you might know from um, Al Gore's movie, this is the western part and it's all below sea level. Uh, when at high tide it's two-thirds, and at low tide it's 50 percent. You understand how that works? Um, and then we, so obviously it's protected by dikes. Eh? If, you, if you have no dikes, then the country will, will get flooded all the time. Uh, these are uh, major rivers coming in. This is the Rhine, this is the Meuse. We have a river here, the Scheldt, that separates in a bunch of branches. And um, uh, also, not only the polders that are below sea level, also the polders that are below level, river level are endangered by climate change. Now, um, we, we have until what time, David, exactly? Uh, we have until half past, so we have one hour. Yeah. Now why don't we spend a little bit of time on a tour through my wonderful country. Um, I learned the patriotism uh, from your country, actually. <laughs> <laughs> now, I hope the music is not too loud and not too... Uh, 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 we'll see how that will work out. So, welcome to the Netherlands. Um, foggy country. <laughs> That was our flag. <laughs> you see why we got the stripes, like everything is flat.
Now, of course, I want to show a couple of things with this uh, slideshow. Uh, the first is, uh, it's a small country, but, you know, um, fourth airport uh, in Europe, uh, biggest port uh, in Europe. Um, we are the third export country of agricultural uh, goods. And um, so, um, uh, so that's sort of interesting for such a small country. And uh, as you might have seen, um, yeah, yeah, I was uh, I was having a friend of mine over, and uh, that was John actually, and um, uh, I'd like to take them through a tour of uh, the port of Rotterdam, and, and it's just so overwhelming, it's so big. So this American guy was saying, oh, I can't believe it, it's all so big, and just the size of this. That's usually what you'd expect someone to say when he's an American, instead of an American at home. Anyway. Uh, and another thing, of course, that I want to show is that, that, that how intermingled the landscape is with the water. I mean, at least half of the pictures, maybe 75%, showed water, and uh, a lot of pictures show so-called primary flood defense. Three, uh, say, 2,000 miles of uh, dikes and dunes uh, that protect all that capital. And that's what that was mainly the uh, goal of this slideshow. Um, I'm going to talk about that, about our primary water system. Um, once more, uh, part of the Netherlands below sea level, part of the Netherlands threatened by uh, river floods. Um, of course, this debate has been uh, uh, um, enhanced by climate change, you can imagine. Uh, there's, uh, I, I, are you sleeping well? I, I am not sleeping, okay. Um, this is what a dike looks like. And um, here's another picture of a dike. Uh, this is a very typically Dutch picture. Kids uh, through the fog driving to school on bikes. Um, now you would think, theoretically, or you would think, practically theoretically, that uh, if sea level rises, all we have to do is raise the dikes. And I'm a product designer, so I came up with an idea. <laughs> um, it's a very simple thing. It um, drives over the dikes, and uh, it's, it, it takes good care of it, the environment, you see. It, it just pops over that little uh, fence that is there, and uh, bike riders can just keep on biking while the machine is working. Um, so it's not a typical engineering solution. <laughs> Um, and uh, what's, uh, what's more, it says, well, when we have to raise the dikes anyway, why wouldn't we cover them all in tulips um, and make the landscape even nicer? Here's another image. And, um, it also uh, complies with the regulations. Uh, it won't go faster than 60 kilometers an hour. Um, so, you know, we're done, actually. Uh, you know, it, it, it travels only 20 meters an hour, and if uh, sea level rises 1.2 meters uh, per century, and it raises the dike only 7 inches, uh, it will just slowly cruise around the Dutch dikes in, in 6 times. It will raise them all, and uh, when we're done, we're fine. So, basically, that's all I have to say. <laughs> uh, victory on the war on water, guaranteed. Thank you very much. Um, it's not like that. A lot of dikes look like this, you see? Um, it's not easy to modify the landscape on a grand scale. And so this, this simple fact of all the houses that are built leaning on a large part of the dikes makes the debate uh, a lot more difficult. For example, um, yeah, therefore you cannot uh, you, couldn't, you shouldn't be talking about a war on water, eh, like uh, a war against the for forces of nature. It is much more a war against each other. Struggle. Um, for example, what could you say about the ultimate dike operator? It will ruin our dike houses. Uh, it's a typical silly engineering solution. We should better let nature run its course. Uh, the bloody thing will be way too expensive. Now, these are three arguments as part of a struggle over uh, how to uh, 
uh, manipulate the forces of nature to our benefit that uh, I want to uh, put central in my talk about the Dutch system. Um, it's about conflict. So the first, the first point that I made uh, is about raising the dikes for all the people who live, who are protected by the dikes versus the people who have their houses leaning on the dikes. So that's a conflict between sectors or between scale levels. You can say the sector is dike dwellers or you can say the scale level is the scale of the whole dike ring that is protected by the dike versus, uh, for example, which you can call regional scale versus the local scale, which are the villages that are built around and on the dikes. Um, that's what I would call one level of conflict. By the way, I'm not a social scientist, so maybe uh, this, uh, I, we'll see, I just came up with this. These three part, these three ways of, these three uh, so possible sources of conflict. Uh, between sectors or scale levels, uh, farmers versus uh, ecologists, that kind of thing. But also, you, can, you, know, you could also say, okay, we, we agree on the interplay of the interests, but we disagree on the method to achieve a certain goal. So we agree on the goal, but we disagree on the method. And usually, the method that you choose has to do with your vision, your mindset, your belief. Um, in this case, for example, uh, we don't like silly engineering solutions. We, we want some kind of Gaia uh, uh, approach. Those could, you could call those two um, attitudes. Um, third level uh, is uh, a conflict that, that can be uh, going on on a higher level. Say, we, we agree on the goals. That some sectors get hit, some sectors get benefited, and somehow everybody agrees. We have a sort of a common mindset, sort of a philosophy of how to approach a problem. But then, uh, on a higher scale level, uh, where the government has to choose between infrastructure or flood protection versus uh, healthcare or, or, or the military or something, uh, there is a conflict, and still a project like raising the dikes or whatever other uh, uh, modification to the water system won't go through. So I'm now going to explain you a little bit on the history of the Dutch water system. Uh, I have the first two two examples of the the biggest uh, the biggest uh, uh, hydraulic engineering projects in uh, in the Netherlands, and uh, the main conflict that has been resolved, uh, leading to the possibility to build this uh, uh, project. This is the closure dam, the big closure dam, that lake that I showed you that I compared to the San Francisco Bay. Um, it used to be an inland sea, so the inland, so this, this dam was not there. The sea stretched all the way, uh, something like 150 miles, something like 100, mi 100 miles to the, to the southwest. And uh, by building this dam, first uh, it lowers the water levels here in, when there's a storm there. That's a benefit of that big dam. And second, um, it creates a freshwater reservoir there. And you might know from the California water system that, of course, freshwater reservoirs are very important for agriculture and drinking water. Um, and uh, for a while, uh, th this, the conservation of this dam started about 200 years ago. Uh, for a while, people were not sure whether it was a good idea, but pretty soon they were. But it was just such a such a huge investment that, for decades, uh, allocating the national uh, tax revenues to this project was the main bottleneck. And it was actually an engineer who became a minister of infrastructure for three subsequent periods of four years that eventually pushed things through and allocated the funding, the national funding, to build this. Second one is uh, conflict over interest. Um, this is an estuary in the south, uh, the, so the North Sea is there, the estuary is here, and, uh, ah, that's not correct actually, the, uh, the North Sea is here and the estuary is there. Um, and um, you can see that by the water, uh, the, the, the tide flowing in like that, you can see that like right there. Um, and this, the original idea was to make a dam comparable to the one you saw before, uh, which is just a dam that completely separates, separates 
these two water bodies. However, um, there was a strong political debate in the 1970s um, because closing the estuary would kill a lot of uh, flora and fauna in the estuary. So uh, eventually a much more expensive solution was chosen uh, and these are all gates that are usually open and let the tide go in and out and uh, animals fish uh, and they only close about once in a couple of years when there's a severe storm at sea. Um, yeah, a little bit of Dutch water history um, in where I want to focus on the conflicts. Um, since that is uh, politics and economics, which uh, is your field, as I understand. Um, you can say that Holland is the biggest machine in the world. It's a machine that is covered by plants and buildings. Um, and um, maybe some of you know a little bit about Holland and know the expression God created the world, but the Dutch created the Netherlands. Anyone know that? So, you know it. Ah, that's great. You have a uh, Dutch... Been there. You've been there. Okay, yeah. you heard that one. That's like every... <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah, but it's, I mean, it's a good one. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the core engineering fundamentals of building this water machine is we turn water into land, we turn land into water. For example, digging a canal. Uh, or what we also did, we extracted a lot of peat from the soil, which uh, turns marshes into lakes. Um, and what is also very important is that in a delta, in a natural delta, uh, the border between water and land is not clear. It, it changes all the time. Every time there's a storm, it changes. There's ebb and flow. There are high river discharges and low river discharges. So a large portion of a delta is neither land nor water, and that's very impractical. When you live in a, when you live somewhere, and any time the water can come, you'd rather be. You were talking about risk and, and, and certainty. You'd rather know what you're up to when you're gonna, you know, run a farm or uh, some kind of business. So we did that also a lot. We we turned a lot of tidal areas uh, into permanent land, and but sometimes also we turned tidal areas into water. For example, making a port. Um, but the general development is more control over the water. Uh, for a while this has been very unfashionable, like we want nature, we want more influence of nature. And uh, sometimes, once I, in the discussion about that, I took a glass of water and I just poured it over the table and I said, do you like this or not? To indicate that control over water is actually a very nice thing, a very practical thing. Okay. Uh, Europeans uh, have been around for a long while, as you might know. Uh, so we start the age of uh, the age of 500. Um, a couple of activities I want to highlight. I want to. I want to uh, damming and pouldering. A dam. What a dam does? There's a little river, and it ends in a sea usually, or in a bigger river. And when you dam that river, it has a lot of advantages. Um, you can control the water level of the river, so ships can cruise more easily. Uh, you block salt water coming in, so you can use the fresh water for agriculture. Uh, you protect against flooding. Um, and uh, it's also a connection between the two shores. So we build a lot of dams in Holland. We started with the small rivers, and as technology and financial resources grew, we dammed more and more bigger rivers because of all these advantages. Then there's pouldering. Pouldering means uh, gaining control over the water level in, a, in, a, in an area by making a dike around it and a pumping station or a windmill to uh, keep the level at a desired uh, height. I'll show you how this works through this drawing. Yeah, um, you can consider uh, some kind of uh, mid. Uh, Harsh landscape, really. Bad weather and a lot of water. And uh, the Romans who described our country are always uh, very, like, you don't want to go there. It's, you get, uh, uh, it's too, too wet. Um, so, of course, we first we started building the houses uh, on the hills. Uh, not that there are many, but um, 
least, uh, yeah. And, uh, but then as, as, as population grew, we moved closer towards the water, first uh, building on stilts and on, on earthen mounds. Um, and then we, it's not so practical, those mounds, because of cattle and, and, and crops. So we started making the dikes uh, to squeeze the water in. Um, and uh, as we drained these lands, the land subsided, and uh, we had to, to keep the groundwater table basically under the land, and we used windmills to pump that water out. Now, uh, which were the conflicts uh, at those times? Um, uh, a simple one is that uh, usually the fishermen uh, weren't too much in favor of uh, sort of decreasing the surface area of the water, you can imagine. Uh, but somehow the farmers, uh, most of the times, won that debate. Um, the second one uh, is that mentality issue. Um, I don't say that the church would have uh, would have been against dikes, but they did use floods to uh, gain power over people because they used to say, if you see, this is an act of God uh, for this and this crime that you have committed. Um, um, and another, you can also say that um, you, you have to imagine that basically for a while there was a conflict between the earthen mounds and the dikes. And the dikes are longer, so they require more collaboration and a view farther in the future. So that was also a conflict at those times. Uh, are we uh, going to focus on the present or are we going to unite and invest on a long term? And it is claimed that this debate, this argument, um, has brought the Netherlands a lot of prosperity because they learned to collaborate and thereby also create a sort of a powerful state in a very early stage of their development thanks to or because of the threat of the water that requires collaboration. Um, another struggle at the time was that making a dike now is a lot easier because of the uh, technology we have and at that time uh, it was uh, it demanded a lot of labor and a lot of capital for a uh, regional uh, community uh, to build it. So uh, people could also farm or wage wars, but they allocated, say, 5% of the workforce on building those dikes. And that has not always been so easy. So, um, big struggle, uh, largely against nature, but also with each other in this early stage. Um, that bouldering activity went on, and controlling water levels went on until present day, but uh, I do divide history in a couple of phases, uh, with the dominant new added technology in that phase. Second phase, 1500 to 1700, uh, the golden age, uh, you might have heard of, of the Netherlands, the merchants who went all over the world and uh, made us... Uh, yeah, brought a lot of capital in the Netherlands uh, was between 1580 and 1672, something like that. Um, and the rich merchants um, uh, invested their capital uh, to some extent in draining lakes. Um, once more, it, Holland was a delta with, with a lot of, also with a lot of lakes and a lot of in. In inland seas, and um, those were very serious, large uh, undertakings. It could take uh, years to drain the lake. It could take, it would take years to build the infrastructure to enable a lake to be drained, uh, and it took a long time for the, to allocate the financial resources. And there were very concrete. There were always protests. You would think. Uh, draining a lake uh, would be practical, so you can uh, initiate agriculture in the in the remaining land. But uh, for example, duck egg collectors—I read that recently in a book—they didn't like the lakes to be drained. For example, they protested very fiercely. Um, same for skippers. 
but the cities wanted the lakes to be drained for two reasons. Uh, sometimes a storm could be so severe that a storm raging like that would push the water in that direction and seriously threaten the city. So either you make a dike to protect from the water, or you just take the water out. <laughs> um, so, so that was a debate between fishermen, skippers, and dock egg collectors against cities for the reason of flood safety and food production. So the cities also realized that uh, uh, draining a lake, reclaiming land, would increase uh, um, uh, the growing of weeds and crops like that. Um, and an interesting uh, thing to, to be aware of is that draining a lake uh, in those days was a very risky undertaking. I mean, a lot of things could go wrong. For example, you could build a 10 very expensive windmills and they would, you know, uh, they could get set on fire by the duck egg collectors, or uh, uh, a dike that was built was uh, was leaking somewhere and would cost a lot. So um, that was also a debate that was going on—a conflict between risk aversion versus entrepreneurship. The rich people could also invest uh, in abroad, for example. That's one of the reasons why the golden age ended. By the way, that uh, a lot of uh, rich people in Holland started to invest in Belgium, Germany, and uh, England. Anyway. Um, you can say that uh, from 1700 to 1900, uh, there was still a lot of reclamation going on. A big inward sea was reclaimed in, in, the, in the 19th uh, century. But um, interesting uh, development in, the, in these two centuries was increasing the uh, shipping routes from Holland to Germany. Um, and that was done by a number of ways. And also there, there was a debate going on, like how... how sh uh, the biggest debate was actually uh, the Germans wanted us to allocate our resources in uh, improving the shipping capacity of rivers because you must imagine that uh, a lot of rivers that we see now have a standardized depth and a standardized standardized width but that has not always been the case sometimes rivers are very shallow and very broad sometimes the rivers are narrower and deeper and but the depth of a ship uh, has to be only as deep as the uh, shallow as part of the river. So uh, by dredging and um, yeah, that's called uh, making groins. Anyone knows what groins are? Uh, this is a groin. It's, it's, they're uh, engineered elements to direct the river flow so the flow of the river dredges the sand out to uh, create a standard depth. Um, so the big debate at that time was that uh, uh, the Germans wanted us to invest uh, our river work, to, wanted us to direct our river works towards uh, better shipping conditions, but we actually preferred to make higher dikes to prevent uh, flooding uh, to the villages and the farmlands surrounding the rivers. Um, so that was serious uh, uh, diplomatic uh, power play uh, in those uh, years, and eventually we did both. We both improved the shipping capacity of the river, and um, uh, the dike, we made the dikes high enough to prevent river flooding. Um, so once more, first level of conflict uh, between interest groups, second level is uh, between mentalities, and the third level is uh, where do we allocate our national uh, resources, funding. Budget. Now, uh, the 20th century was the century of the big uh, engineering projects, and um, largely uh, on activities that could be called shortening coastline. Um, you can, you, if you if you see the coastline as as, as this long, uh, as this length, like that, and these are estuaries. Uh, it can stretch over for over a thousand miles. So first we started making these small dams that dam these small rivers, uh, shortening already the coastline. And in the 20th century, we had the technology and the money to uh, dam even these uh, estuaries. By the way, this is that big dam that is a compromise that, that both is able to shut, shut off this estuary and let water through under normal circumstances. Um, now, what were the debates there? Um, 
for a while until say the 70s uh, there was just no awareness of the fact that making a dam <coughs> like that and turning this estuary into a freshwater lake I hope you can imagine that that happens when, when you make a dam like that um, some people talk about this for the delta um, uh, in here in, uh, in, Be uh, in, in uh, California um, but slowly the awareness grew that when you dam an estuary like that and turn it into a freshwater lake it kills, uh, it destroys the, the ecological system. Um, so that was the debate that, that continues on to today over this type of activity of, of shortening the coastline through the um, Flood safety and freshwater reservoirs for agriculture versus ecology. Um, and those two interest groups have different mindsets, you would say. Often it's said uh, economic mindset versus an ecological mindset. I'm not so fond of that term, uh, but it's definitely, I, I would rather say an engineering mindset, sort of a, a, a no-nonsense, um, relatively cheap solution uh, is a dam in, in economic terms. But when you, when you integrate, when you approach ecology from a economic perspective, you cannot say that there's an economic mindset and there's an ecological mindset. But anyway, I hope you sort of get the, 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 the power play that was going on here. Um, and another thing was that it's very expensive to build these dams, uh, for especially this particular dam that has, that, 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 that's actually uh, one that, uh, that I photographed there. Um, and, um, but the funny thing is, uh, in the 50s or 60s, we discovered a huge natural gas resource in the north of the Netherlands, and uh, that brought so much money in that uh, we uh, that that made it easier to choose for the expensive uh, closable dam over there. So that's how you can see that that third level of conflict, third, third approach of conflict, can be solved um, uh, with money. Uh, David is sort of opposed to throwing money at a problem, but sometimes it can, of course, help. Um, this is a closure uh, masterpiece, they call it, of that development of shortening the coastline. This is basically the mouth of the Rhine, the, one of the major Dutch rivers. And we want to keep it open. We don't build a dam just like that, because the ships, we want the ships to go freely in and out. That's one of the reasons why Rotterdam is the, has been the biggest port of the world for, for a century or so, and now uh, the biggest one in Europe. Uh, it's simply because, uh, it's one of the reasons that there, there are no locks, because locks slow shipping down. It's very nice for ships to just freely go in and out of a port and just cruise all the way to Germany. Um, so you can imagine, uh, so, so the idea behind it, this is by the way the length of an Eiffel Tower. Um, and uh, it only closes <coughs> about once in ten years, when the sea level on that side is so high that it threatens the city of Rotterdam on that side. Now, you see that the periods are getting shorter as we are uh, reaching uh, the present day. Uh, 1993 to 2009, I would say the most water engineering projects went into uh, the river system. And, um, there, the debate is between two mentalities, really. Uh, raising the dikes is seen as uh, a conventional, traditional mentality, and widening the rivers is seen as an innovative and progressive mentality. Um, uh, has anyone heard of something called room for the rivers? Is that something that's going on in the United States as well? Does that ring a bell to you, David? No? Not yet. Anyway, um, it works like this. Um, a river, if, if there would be no dikes along rivers, the river would just, any time in winter when there's a lot of water discharge, it would overflow uh, the floodplains, and sometimes they can stretch very long, and it's very impractical for farms and houses that are uh, built there. So that's why in all over the world we build dikes along rivers. Um, 
and if uh, for some reason the river discharge increases, or uh, if uh, we want more safety, we can raise the dikes. This yellow part is uh, an example of that. Um, and we've been doing that for so long in the Netherlands that people didn't like it so much anymore. Um, and also because of those houses that I showed you that are built on the dikes. Um, and another way to lower the river water level is to remove the dike. But in general, it's a much more expensive way of dealing with uh, this problem. Uh, here is a, an example of how that works. Uh, this is the old river, by the way. This is a canal that they dug because a canal is more controllable. You can control the river flow better. And this is the old dike. This is the current dike, actually. And now the idea is, or the, the project is, it's, it's going to be built, is to uh, remove this dike and build a dike here. So when high water comes, this whole area gets flooded, and uh, the total water level, you can imagine, is lower when this whole area gets flooded than when just this area between this dike and that dike would get flooded. So that's the program room for the rivers. Um, those two mindsets, I'll get back to that later. Uh, I, I'll get back to it now, actually, yeah. This was, this was actually the, the debate that inspired me to, to, to design this ultimate dike operator. Um, because for a while, uh, two things were heard in the debate over the water system. One was, uh, we cannot raise dikes anymore because uh, all kinds of reasons that were not so uh, well articulated. Uh, but mostly it was that we just don't want to keep doing the same thing uh, again. And on the other hand, the politicians were saying climate change is the biggest threat of the Netherlands and uh, uh, we have to spend a lot of money to, uh, to, to work on that. And our frustration at the university was if you say that climate change is the biggest threat, you just cannot say that raising dikes is not an option. You have to consider, consider that in the whole range of options. And uh, uh, this was mockery on my part over uh, that urge that politicians and, and um, uh, professionals can have to, to be innovative. Um, I personally feel that you shouldn't be innovative for the sake of being innovative. You should be innovative because you want to solve a certain problem. But if traditional methods can solve that problem better, then don't innovate for the sake of innovation. Something to think about, I hope, in this uh, country of in California. Anyway, good. That means good. Yeah. <laughs> um, Netherlands water history. history. How do <coughs> conflicts get resolved? Um, I explained a little bit, but uh, I think it comes down to uh, often a disaster happens, like a flooding mostly. And uh, if there are uh, groups quarreling with each other, um, a disaster often points the noses in one direction um, and because of the urge, because of the trauma that usually uh, is left behind after a disaster, uh, often the mindset, the way of thinking uh, uh, focuses and that makes it also easier to conduct a project and um, you can imagine that when a disaster happens that the national funding uh, is easier to, to raise. Funds are easier to raise. Um, another way to resolve a conflict is a strong authority. Um, I get that that's a problem right now in, in California when it comes to investing in, uh, in the California water system. Um, again, uh, to persuade a group that is disadvantaged uh, to advocate a uh, mindset, a uh, belief, an, ad, an approach to a problem, and obviously to lobby for money in the national uh, treasury. Um, it could also happen that times are so prosperous uh, that money makes it easier, makes it possible to, to have a more expensive solution that compromises different uh, interests. Um, the opposite can also happen during World War II. Some big reclamation projects went on, but 
we can say, especially right after World War II, we spent more money on building houses and rebuilding the, 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 the road and rail infrastructure and sort of neglected the dikes. In 1953, we had a huge traumatizing um, flooding in, in the southwest of the country because there, we didn't spend enough money uh, because of World War II on uh, maintaining the dikes properly. Um, and now, when you read the history on the water system, it's also, you see the persistence. Sometimes it can take a, a century and keep on studying, keep on debating, keep on thinking about something. And uh, that's a very simple thing that, that uh, you could take with you uh, when you were in a constant persistence. And then, number five, not, all, not everybody can read it, but it's an uh, academic, rational, objective analysis. <laughs> And, uh, of course, uh, I don't have to defend that at the university. Um, now, from history to future. And now we get to the project that I'm personally involved in. Um, I must say that the current Dutch water system is functioning, functioning pretty well. We have high, uh, we have very low probabilities of flooding. We have very good shipping conditions. Uh, it almost never, it sometimes happens that there is a drought, not enough water coming in, and agriculture suffers from that. Uh, but relatively, that's pretty well organized. The weakest uh, aspect is ecology. I mean, because it's only been three or four decades that we even care about ecology, uh, that a lot of infrastructure that has been built uh, has destroyed a lot of ecosystems. Uh, so, that's a, that turns into a driver for, for changing the system, for altering the system. Um, as I said, climate change is a big driver for uh, big projects like billion uh, euro projects to modify the system. And when it comes to flood safety, you can say, okay, we have a probability of 1 in 10,000 of getting flooded, and we want a probability of 1 in 100,000 because uh, we have so much capital to protect. Uh, it's a very political question what the protection level is uh, that you want. You can say, I, I take a bet, or uh, I, I want to be absolutely safe. There are eco economic ways to calculate that, but what it comes down to is that it's uh, quite a political question. How safe do you want to be? Um, and then there are the new goals. And you can also alter, change the uh, water system, uh, uh, make more lakes, or make uh, more... Uh, Make the rivers wider so they become more beautiful for purposes of recreation, uh, landscape quality, and nature development. Okay, now what do, how could those projects look like? This is important. Um, uh, this is the Maslow Pyramid. Who, who knows the Maslow Pyramid? Okay, that's good. Um, I suppose you're all watching each other because you're, you, you can uh, use, the, when someone sticks his hand up, you can use that in creating each other's report. Right? Um, um, you can imagine that in the water system, basic functions like flood protection, uh, agricultural water supply, and shipping uh, correspond to the lower parts of the Maslow pyramid, while recreation and, and, and housing with water, which is nice, and um, nature development is sort of higher in the Maslow uh, hierarchy. This is uh, what my personal research academic research focus on. Um, and then there's climate change. Now, if you... Uh, you can imagine that climate change mostly deals with uh, what's happening down here in the pyramid. Flood safety. Uh, flood safety is threatened by climate change. Um, uh, 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 agriculture can be threatened by climate change. And that's where we like to spend our money most. Down there in the Maslow pyramid. Um, now, what are, the, what are the scenarios that the government is working with when it comes to climate change? For you to know that sea level is, is already, has already been rising for the last centuries, uh, 20 centimeters a, a century. Uh, if you would draw that, if you would continue that line, it would go like this. And this is already, by our Dutch scientists, um, considered the, the lowest uh, sea level rise that we are counting on. And um, the, uh, uh, yeah, and, and there was a national 
committee, influential committee, um, that says, well, if you, we better prepare for the worst scenario. Uh, you can think about whether you think that that is a good strategy or not. I think it depends on how much money you have to spend. Um, but they say, well, if you build a bridge, you prepare for the biggest truck that will drive over the bridge. So when we rebuild our uh, water system, we better prepare for um, the, 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 the worst climate change scenario. It's a very big debate. Because it's, it's about a lot of money. Um, so that committee is similar to the Blue Ribbon Task Force Committee that you had, Delta Vision Committee. Or maybe some of you knows about that, heard about that. Uh, also, uh, that's usually what governments do when they want when they want a big project and uh, uh, that requires a lot of money. They establish a committee with important people. Uh, that is to judge on whether the money will be well spent or not. Um, so this, this is from the report of that committee, all kinds of projects throughout the country, and um, this is an old fresh water from this lake when, when the water is, is good enough. Um, and one of the ways to uh, change the quality of the water quality is to turn the freshwater lake back into a saltwater lake. Um, that will cost something like that. It, it, it could only cost 100 or 200 million euros. Um, but um, not much will change, only the, the water quality. And we came up at Delft University of Technology with a different solution. We said, why don't you uh, make a canal like that? I'll show you how it works. And not simply make the, the, the freshwater lake salt, but connect the freshwater lake to this lake that, had, that is not only salt, but also has a lot of tidal dynamics and it creates much nicer nature. I will show you some graphics just for you to get an image of how we're, how we're building this machine. This is what it is now. This is, this is a complicated dam because this is fresh and this is salt and it shouldn't mix. And then we have these reservoirs and the ships are cruising through here. This is a canal that goes from Rotterdam over there to Antwerp. Now, our solution would look like that. You see, just, you know, uh, and so the idea was to just completely remove this dam and make the canal like that. So all the bad stuff is happening in the canal, but it's not, it's, you know, you, you accept that. And this whole lake, uh, instead of being a, a dreadful, nasty lake, you connect it to this big lake and the ecology is all nice. And you have uh, migratory birds, for example, they, they like sand plates that are just covered in a little bit of water. That's, that's what they like best. Um, and, um, uh, and here you see the dam being removed and the plate, uh, and the plate uh, emerging. Um, and the same is happening here. You get instead of sort of boring vegetation, you get these, these uh, uh, tidal plates. Um, now, what are the conflicts here? Farmers versus ecologists. That conflict has basically been solved by saying, okay, uh, we can change, we have to improve the, the, the water quality of that lake, but the farmers may not be disadvantaged. So some kind of solution has to be found to get the fresh water for the, for the farmers from somewhere else. Um, then we have only 10 minutes left. Uh, the problem solving mindset versus integrated regional improvement mindset. That's a, that's a debate that's still being fought. I think that the current attitude is solving the problem of the blue algae and um, I think we can get much more out of that project if we take a broader perspective. Um, and the big, big thing that we argue about now is how much tax money can we spend on improving ecology? How many taxpayers are find that worthwhile. And that's, that's an important issue for, for, for each of you to think about if you ever get into some kind of uh, politics, because I think that will, be, uh, will become a, a very important issue in the, in the, in the, in the near future. Um, this is a, another problem. This is our big reservoir for all the agricultural land in the, in the north. And what happens is that we, the, the, the run water flows in fills this reservoir, then here's that big dam, and the water flows into the sea uh, by gravity, okay? 
Uh, that's, that happens there. Now, if, um, if sea level rises, uh, the water from the lake cannot flow in the sea anymore because the sea level is too high. So there are two options then. It's raising the dikes along that lake so the water level can rise again and it can, against gravity, flow back in the sea. Um, or we can make a pumping station and pump the water out. Now, pumping stations at this moment are very impopular in the Netherlands. Um, uh, but raising the dikes is also very impopular. So this is a, like a lose-lose situation. <laughs> You must know the win-win situation. Um, and our, uh, as Delft University of Technology, our way to engage in the debate is to come up with alternatives. And our alternative is to say, well, we don't like raising the dikes, it costs a lot of money, people who live there don't like it. Uh, but, what, but to reduce the harm of pumping the water out, we reduce the influx of water by uh, a, a modern, ecologically friendly, uh, where our dam uh, that we can build right here. Um, you don't have to understand all of it, but just a little bit of how we play with water in the Netherlands. And it takes a long debate before we make a decision. But, uh, okay, what are the conflicts here? Dyke villages versus the state. And the state can say we want that big fresh water reservoir. The state can say we don't want a big pumping station because it doesn't feel good or it, it creates carbon dioxide, or it creates a big energy bill. Um, that's a big debate. Um, then there are people who say, well, pumping and building dams is an engineering mindset, and we don't like that. We want moving along with the water, raising the dikes, and allowing the water to flow freely in the sea is more a sense of moving along with the water. Um, and then a big debate is, well, how serious is climate change? Because that's if we are sure and we measure the pace of climate change, uh, that would be a good incentive to spend a lot of money on it. But when we're not sure yet, we're not sure whether we want to spend the money on it. Now, these are a uh, project that uh, we are, as a university, it's not so easy to break into the debate. But here, uh, when it comes to Rotterdam, we have a very good position. Uh, this, is a, this is actually a drawing of mine that was adopted by that committee that I talked about. So that was a huge success for, uh, for our university. And um, I'll show you how it works. Basically what it comes down to is we have Rotterdam here. So this is all urbanized. You see this, this dark stuff is all urbanized. And um, um, uh, this region is threatened by a storm surge from here and the river flux by the river Rhine coming from there. You can imagine that two uh, waves of water coming together is a particularly high risk. Um, and, and, and this is what you... There are about two or three million people living close to the water, and uh, all the waterfronts are more or less urbanized, uh, as you see here. So, you can, <laughs> just to give you an impression of the whole climate change issue, that it's a big issue, I mean, just imagine. Uh, the risk rising here and the water levels rising here. I mean, these dwellers, <laughs> seriously, they're, they're going to be in trouble. Um, now, um, it's already happening. Uh, this, this is so-called outside of the dike building. Uh, now, I'll go through this quickly, but for you to understand what a Dutch waterfront looks like, um, this is for the people in the back. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not just a dike and just water, there's also an outer dike area. And over the last centuries, also the outer dike area has been built. Uh, there have been development going on there. Um, and it varies where you are, factories, dwellings, recreation. And basically, there are two uh, reasons why we, we, are going, we might be going to alter the 300 kilometers of waterfront, this is a huge project. Uh, either we have a more strict law, and the law in Holland, uh, our flood uh, risk is determined by law. Um, that's, I think we are the only country who have a law that prescribes a certain flood uh, safety norms. Um, or climate change. If the law change stays the same, but the climate changes, the dikes still don't need the law, or both happens, so that would then mean that we would have 
to raise the dikes, and all conflicts will emerge that I just described. Um, now, here we see that region again. We have uh, water sea threat from the west, river threat from the east. We already have a bunch of dams, and we could, uh, if we don't do anything, the probability of a dike failure will grow when climate change advances. Um, and um, but what we uh, and, and so, but uh, interesting solution would be to also protect uh, this urbanized area by new barriers to build like that. And as a second advantage, um, it would also protect better this outside of the dike uh, region. Okay. How can I? Let me see if I can explain that a bit more. Yeah. Um, the last thing about, about the relationship between a local interest and a national policy. Um, if we, on a national scale, would choose to protect the in, inner dike region more, it, would also, it could also benefit the, the, the waterfront. If you're a developer and I ask you, there are two pieces of waterfront property, one uh, with a probability that the water can you know, come high, uh, of this much, and uh, one with a uh, guarantee that the water will not get higher than this, which one would you prefer? You would probably prefer the waterfront with a controlled water level. Um, now, that would mean that the national government would benefit developers and local governments. So that's an important conflict that is going on there. Good. Dwellers versus skippers, yeah, that's an important issue here also. Uh, if you make these barriers, if they close, say, once a year, uh, ships can't pass. So, that's an important conflict that we have to resolve. Uh, and what I explained, uh, waterfront development is the state, is tax money worthwhile to spend on enhancing conditions for waterfront development, Na national level versus local. Level. Now, I'm going to end. This is the place where uh, the river splits into. I find that uh, interesting. Um, I, I really, I, I hope that somehow you're, you can feel the fascination for uh, a water system like that and, and how it serves as big machine where people live upon and how challenging it, it is to uh, change the water system like that. Um, but you might also you know, think about for yourself, uh, if you're going into economics or into politics, uh, how you want to relate to those different uh, levels of conflict that I described. Um, you might want to uh, uh, promote the interest of a certain region where you are uh, associated with for uh, a certain sector like ecology or farming or something that you that you have feelings for, um, and for me personally, um, or yeah, or on the third level, you might go into politics and have opinions about whether you want to spend money on healthcare, defense, or infrastructure. Um, uh, I'm not sure if I'm ready for that yet, but uh, after my conversation with David, I. Uh, that we should have some more, and uh, you can give me some courage to, uh, to move to that, and the same for you guys. Um, I would highly admire it if you, if you dare to take on those problems, on that, on that higher level of allocating funds. Uh, when it comes to um, sectors and scale levels, uh, I, I feel that uh, I would like to uh, advocate uh, investments in the higher region of the Maslow Pyramid. Uh, it's, it's somehow safe to keep investing in, in, the, in the base of that pyramid, but I think we could also, we should uh, be grateful that we, we have the money to invest in making the country more attractive and uh, enhancing the ecology. Um, I'd like to take a stand for that. And when it comes to mindsets, I'm not really a religious kind of person, for example, for a Gaia kind of perspective or something like that. I would... Uh, I, I like uh, the academic mindset, of course. Um, 
um, analytically uh, not wanting to sell a project but uh, uh, care about the quality of the debate uh, surrounding uh, these, these kinds of issues. Okay, and to illustrate uh, the, 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 my belief in solutions coming forth from a severe debate that can join different perspectives. I, I love this image because it shows that there is a combination between ecology and uh, uh, engineering big infrastructure that, that, that is uh, technically uh, uh, possible. Okay, thank you for having me and I wish you all wisdom in your career.